what is up everyone welcome back to a brand new video in today's video we are going to be showing you guys how we built the diy float wheel kit the float wheel kit is essentially a replica of future motions one wheel pint to us the float wheel is a breakthrough in terms of diy one wheels as i feel this is the first diy one wheel that actually performs close to an actual future motion one wheel and has good quality all of the parts that go into the kit cost around 600 dollars, which is quite a bit cheaper than the actual one wheel pint before we teach you guys how we built this thing and show you guys our build process, I just want to give a huge shout out to Mario Contino. Without his help, we would have never been able to successfully program and finish our DIY float wheel. He's got a YouTube channel with tons of really cool float wheel and DIY one wheel as well as regular one wheel content. He's been a huge help throughout this process and you should definitely go check him out. We'll have a link to his channel down in the description below. So thank you Mario for all of your help. Now without further ado, let's get into how we built our float wheel and what our process looked like. Step one is to take the CNC precision made rail from aluminum and thread all of the wires that go between the front and the rear enclosure of the float wheel. For the purpose of keeping our cables safe, we put some heat shrinkable sleeving around all of the thin wires so they don't get spliced open on accident within the rail itself. We threaded all of the cables that we tied together with that heat shrinking tube first. We tied the thinner cables together which was very helpful in getting them to go through on a heavier connector. I would definitely recommend putting in the thicker cables before you put in the smaller ones as it's a lot harder to get those thicker ones in afterwards. On the right side of the rail looking from the inside you'll want the female black connector and any of the ends of the thin 2 pin JST and then on the left side like we've shown here you'll want the male black connector. Then you'll want to thread in the XT60 battery harness. I definitely recommend putting this one in before you put in the thinner cables as getting that thick connector through can be tricky. These are the cables that you'll want on the right side of the aluminum rail from the inside and these are the ones you'll want on the left side. This is what your rail should look like once you've gotten all those wires through. The next step is to thread the charge port through the built-in threads on the side of the aluminum rail. Just spin it into place all the way until it can't move anymore. Just note that it isn't going to sit perfectly flushly due to the curvature of the rail. The next step is to insert these gaskets. We had to slice them open with an X-Acto knife to open the slits in between them, then thread all of the wires from both of the sides of the aluminum rail through the gasket and then insert the gasket into the side of the rail. It's perfectly fit to size, which is super nice and will keep any of that moisture out from getting into your electronics compartments. The next step is to secure the anti-spin plates to the side of the float wheel rail and we definitely recommend using Loctite for this so they don't get loose. Just use any screwdriver and screw them into the side of the rail tightly so that the spin plate doesn't move anymore. Next we have the gigantic hub motor which we're going to be attaching to one of the rails. We slid on our rail with all of the wires already inside of it first onto the side of the hub motor that didn't have any wires coming out of it. It's a pretty snug fit so just make sure that you tinker around with it until it slides on all the way. Once the one wheel rail is all the way onto the shaft of the motor you'll want to use one of these securing nuts to screw all the way on to the hub motor and attach the rail to the motor. You can then use the extra spin plates included to secure this nut all the way down so that the rail is firmly attached to the motor. You'll want to repeat this process for the other side, first securing the anti-spin plate to this rail. You'll then want to insert the gasket into the other rail which is going to contain the motor phase wires and then thread these motor phase wires through the rubber gasket so that they'll go into the rear compartment area. You can then secure the other rail onto the float wheel hub motor using the exact same process as before. This bolt in particular is prone to becoming loose while riding so make sure it's well tightened but also make sure that you're careful and not splicing any of the wires accidentally while screwing it in. The next step is to insert the rear metal plate into the two slits in the back of the rails. If your two rails aren't properly screwed on to the hub motor, this could cause some issues when sliding this metal plate in as it's a very tight fit and it's meant to fit in there perfectly when the rails are properly on all the way. Once you've slid the plate all the way on, you'll want to attach it to the run wheel rails using six of these screws that they've included using the Starhead screwdriver that they've also put in the kit. We got the kit with the 3D printed part right here but you can also 3D pin it yourself and this goes in the rear enclosure. You can attach it to the rear enclosure using these two screws and nuts that they've included in the kit. It just goes through the bottom of that aluminum plate and then the nut goes on the inside here and then you can tighten it down on both sides using a screwdriver and a wrench. Now the one thing not included in the float wheel kit are the pint bumpers that you'll have to buy from Future Motion as these are gonna slide perfectly into the rails of your DIY one wheel pint. 
So the first step in this assembly is to get the light bar from the float wheel kit and then peel off the sticky adhesive on the front side of this. This is going to be used to attach it to the front bumper of the one wheel pint. Make sure that you attach the white light to the front bumper and the red one to the rear bumper as they are color specific. There's a specific spot on the front bumper for this light bar. It's just going to sit nicely so that the lights kind of poke out from that slit in the front bumper. And once you've done this, you can attach the protection, which is covered in this kind of sticky film. And you'll want to remove that entirely so it's a nice clear bar and use the, the adhesive already on the one wheel light bar. You can then slide it in and stick it to the adhesive on the light bar. We can then take this front bumper and slide it into the front side of the rails on the opposite end from that metal plate that we just installed. The float wheel rails and the bumper should fit perfectly as they've been tooled to match each other identically. The front bumper is then secured to the rails using a couple more screws. After that, we inserted the power switch into the hole in the side of the rail that's designated for it. Then came the struggle of fitting the second 3D printed piece into the front enclosure right here. It's a really poorly designed piece and it took us countless attempts to try to get it in here. It has to be secured into place using either double sided tape or some hot glue. We then secured the VESC mount to the inside of one of the front enclosure one wheel rails using the three screws included. This part was also kind of tricky as there's not much room to spin that allen key and secure it using those three cap head screws. We then started the wiring of the electronics which the first step was to attach the hall sensor adapter to the hall sensor cable coming out of the motor. It's important to note that these motors can be swapped around for some sort of manufacturing defect and this is the case with us. We just had to make sure that they all aligned properly and then clipped the wires that weren't aligned properly and resoldered them together. At this point we were also able to connect the phase wires coming out of the hub motor into the phase wires of the VESC and the hall sensor adapter into the hall sensor port on the VESC. Speaking of which, the VESC used in the float wheel build is the Balance Pro which is specifically made by float wheel. I found this to be a really great VESC for building DIY one wheels. It's got a built-in internal IMU which is super great if you're building any sort of self-balancing electric vehicle. The Balance Pro gets mounted to the mounting plate which we've already secured into the side of the rail using four of the screws included. Next we've got the battery which is a 222 watt hour 12 S1P Tesla battery pack made from 21700 cells. This battery took us quite a while to get. As you can see it's marked as 95 watt hours here but it's actually 222 watt hours. The construction of the pack looks good. It's got a control male connector right here and an XT60 connector. The XT60 connector will obviously be used for discharge and that black control connector connects into the power switch which will control the BMS and turn the float wheel either off or on. This 1P battery pack can only discharge at 20 amps which is really going to hurt the power on this board. The first step in installing it is just clearing up the rear enclosure and then it'll slide in basically fit perfectly to dimension in the rear enclosure. We used some double sided adhesive to make sure that the battery pack won't move in there. We tried using velcro but it was too thick when we put the foot pads on top. So you'll have to use some really thin adhesive or glue to hold the float wheel pack in place. We can now move on to the rear bumper which is going to have a similar process to the front bumper in terms of installing the rear light bar. It's also got that sticky adhesive, just stick it into place on the bumper, make sure that those lights align and then insert this clear protector onto the front of the lights so that it won't get damaged if any rocks hit it. The rear bumper can then be slid onto the back side of the float wheel into those rails, it should be a pretty good fit once again. Then connect the 2-pin into the 2-pin on the light bar which will supply it with power. You can then connect the two XD60 connectors for discharge and then finally the two black connectors for input and control on the power switch to the battery BMS. Everything in the rear enclosure of the float wheel is done at this point and this is what ours looked like right before sealing it up using four of the screws included and the foot pad which just sits nicely right on the top. The foot pad is secured using an allen key which is included with the float wheel kit. The rear bumper is still loose so you'll need to use these wood screws to essentially screw the rear bumper into the foot pad. It's kind of a weird way of holding it into place. While they've included a screwdriver for you to do this, I definitely recommend using a driver or drill with a star bit as this is going to save you a lot of time and energy. Moving back to the front enclosure, we can connect the two black control wires coming from the power switch to that of the battery and the harness. We can then connect several of the other cables starting with this kind of weird adapter which plugs into the UART port on the Balance Pro slash VESC. One of the ends of that Y splitter adapter will connect into the Bluetooth module which it's important you get the order right on according to the original float wheel tutorial as you could otherwise damage the Bluetooth module so just make sure you get it right the first time to avoid potential damage. 
on this piece. Once you've gotten the Bluetooth module plugged into the Y connector, you can then flip it over and connect one of the two pins from the light bar into the two pin on the Bluetooth module. This is what's going to supply the light bar voltage coming from the VESC. It's definitely an interesting process of connections and it can be confusing, but essentially you'll have this two pin which goes into the inside on the front light bar. And then coming again out of the light bar, you'll have another two pin which will connect to the two pin going all the way across the side of the rail into the rear enclosure to the one if you just remember we plugged into the rear light bar. The next step that we've got is connecting the four pin coming out of the power switch to this four pin on the VESC so that when the power switch turns on, the light on the power switch will also glow indicating that the board is on. And then we connected this three pin into the VESC which just has a single red wire coming out of it. Next we connected the charge port which was done by taking the 2 pin JST wire connecting into the charge port and then connecting it into the 2 pin JST which is wired in parallel to the discharge harness. At this point we connected the battery to the ESC by plugging in the XT60 harness into the XT60 on the VESC. Going back to that Y adapter plugging into the UART port, there's then another adapter that we plug into that. This adapter will then plug into the four wires coming out of the JST that plugs into the foot sensor pad. This is essentially going to provide the input to the ADC controls on the UART port to know whether your foot is pushing on the pad or not. Essentially the purpose is just to connect the foot pad to the UART port. There's also a light bar on the foot pad which needs to be connected to the necessary components to make sure that it lights up. The first thing we've got is that four pin with a single red wire coming out of it which will plug into the JST connector on the far right side. This one will just supply power to the light bar so that it can turn on. There's also another four pin, this time more to the center of the light bar, which will be plugged into another four pin, which has a black and white wire. This one is gonna be used for the voltage so that the light bar knows exactly how much battery you have. This information will be displayed using the five dots on the top of the foot pad so that you can see how much battery you have while riding. Inside of the front enclosure, it's a pretty big jumble of wires, so I'll do my best right here to sum it up. You'll have the three phase wires and the sensor wire connecting into the Balance Pro, then the Y splitter going into the Bluetooth module, which will kind of go in a chain to the front light bar, which will then connect into the rear light bar. You'll also have the two XT60 from the harness connecting to each other, which will connect in parallel to the charge port. You'll have the foot sensor pad connecting into one other end of that Y connector and then two cables going into your light bar to supply it power and also to give it a voltage to know how much battery you have. Hopefully that helps. It is kind of confusing. I definitely felt intimidated at first by this. Now we've got the hardest, most frustrating, and most time consuming part of the build, which is programming the float wheel. We're not going to be showing you guys how to do that in this video. But if you are looking to do that at this point, we recommend you watch Mario Contino's video. He's got a 45 minute long video where he fully explains everything in detail, how to program your float wheel and get the settings dialed in. I followed the settings in his video and they've worked very well on our float wheel. So make sure you guys go check out Mario Contino's channel if you guys want to learn more about programming your VESC. All right, moving back to the float wheel, now that we've programmed up the VESC, the last step is to attach the foot pad to the rails, which is done by using the four screws included. There's already threads in the rails, so it's a pretty simple process. Additionally included in our float wheel kit, there was this leather handle, which can be attached to the side of one of the float wheel rails and used to carry the float wheel, which is a really nice feature because these things are heavy and very awkward to carry. It comes with these two screws, those two caps, and the leather strap. There are two holes on the side of one of the rails. You just insert the caps into those two holes on both sides, making sure that the leather handle is on the top as shown and the grooves match up perfectly. Then you can insert the two screws through the bottom side of the rail. These then screw directly into those two caps as they have threads inside of them. And when you fasten them down, it'll be secured into place and you can use that leather strap as a handle. And there you guys have it. That's how we built the DIY float wheel. And this is what the finished project looked like.
Overall, I'm super impressed as to how the DIY float wheel kit came out. It looks pretty much identical to a one wheel pint. I'm pretty sure you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference unless you actually got up close. The resemblance between the two is pretty striking. Float wheel has really put a lot of work into all of the tiny details that make this thing as close to one wheel pint as possible. For example, the light bars on the front and rear are probably the most distinguishing factor that set this one apart from a lot of other DIY one wheel models as many of them don't have integrated light systems and I thought that was super cool. Another unique feature that we really like is the battery indicator located on the top of the front foot pad through the five dots. There are also two other dots which will indicate whether or not your foot is on the sensor pressure pad and they'll light up when you push down on it so you know if you're engaging the foot pad to start up the one wheel. Overall, I have to say that the float wheel is very well thought out. This entire kit goes together seamlessly and makes the DIY kit look pretty much identical to that of an authentic Future Motion one wheel pint. Aside from the few snags that we ran into, which are easily surmountable, this thing was pretty easy to put together and I would say anyone with basic DIY electric skateboard skills or DIY skills should be able to do this with enough persistence and dedication. Alright, so to close out this video, we're just going to be showing you guys some of our riding footage with the float wheel and commentating on how we think it performs and the specs that it has. So as it would turn out, not only does the float wheel look amazing, it also rides amazing too. The ride feeling on the float wheel is incredible and a huge step up from the first DIY one wheel that we made, and this is largely attributed to the version 3.0 VESC tool and the new settings that we've inputted into the Balance Pro in this version of our DIY one wheel. As you can see right here, the float wheel is extremely responsive when you try and switch directions. It doesn't jerk or anything, make any clicking sounds, which makes the overall ride feel super good and smooth, which to me is the most important feature in a one wheel. Not the top speed, not the range, not the power, but how well your board responds to you riding and how smooth it is, because if you don't feel comfortable riding your self-balancing vehicle, the odds are you're not going to take it out much, because safety is our number one priority, and having a board that goes fast isn't any use if you don't feel you have control on it. Now to add on to the smoothness and the responsiveness of the board, this also means that you can off-road and take it places that you'd take an actual one wheel without feeling like it's going to bail out on you. We've actually tried to make ourselves fall off the float wheel by going on terrain that we didn't think it would be able to balance on and it honestly handled pretty well. As you can see right here, we kind of just went crazy on the bark chips and the float wheel handled it perfectly. The only time that we fell off was when the tire actually lost traction with the bark chips. This is super nice because coming from our old float wheel, we were always scared that the software is just going to cut out on us and we didn't feel very safe on it. However, after riding the float wheel for a couple of weeks now, we feel very safe on it and trust that it's going to keep us upright and balanced. You can brake all the way and the board will come to a stop and even hit the tail nose and it'll just keep going and keep balancing. Again, you can see the responsiveness of the board right there. It's also a very nimble board. It turns very sharply and smoothly due to the nature of the short deck. Additionally, the float wheel has so much control that we even felt comfortable taking it off of curbs and doing some curb drops on it. I wasn't expecting it to be able to do this, but as you can see right here, the balancing keeps itself up and it just keeps powering through. In terms of the other specs, we haven't really gotten to test the full potential of the float wheel, but from what I've heard, it tops out at right around 16 to 17 miles an hour. And if we calculate the battery capacity to be 222 watt hours, assuming that the hub motor gets 30 watt hours per mile, which is what our other one wheel got, you should get right around seven to eight miles riding pretty moderately. If you're riding a little bit slower, you can probably squeeze out 10 miles on the float wheel. This thing is not meant to be a very long cruiser. It's built more like the pint, like we said. One of the biggest issues that I have heard about the float wheel is the stock battery that comes with it. It can only output 20 amps and in the one P configuration, it means you'll get a lot of sag when riding up hills. So it's mainly used for flat ground riding. It's definitely not going to be an extremely powerful one wheel like one would expect the one wheel XR to be. We will make another review video in the future where we completely share our experience riding the float wheel, what we think of its performance, its specs, and also its smoothness after we've gotten some more time riding it. That way you guys can get some more detailed opinions on what we think after riding this board for more than just a couple of weeks. All right, that's pretty much all that I have for you guys today in this video. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and also commenting down below what you think of the float wheel. 
We'll have a link down in the description if you're interested in learning more about the float wheel kit. Also, if you aren't already subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing for lots of electric skateboard reviews, DIY electric skateboard builds, electric scooter reviews, electric bike reviews, anything electric vehicle related. If you want it, we have it here on this channel, so please subscribe for more of that. We appreciate that very greatly and it helps us out. So thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.